Good day, everyone, and welcome. On behalf of Cambridge Health Tech Institute's Global Web Symposia Series and our sponsor, Biomodels LLC, I'd like to welcome you to Utilizing Notobiotic Mice to Understand the Role of the Microbiome in Murine Disease Models. My name is Elizabeth Flam, and I'll be your host and the moderator for today's event. I'd like to introduce our presenters for today. First is Caitlin S. L. Perello, PhD, for Biomodels. And our second presenter is Jennifer M. Phelan, Product Manager, Taconic Biosciences. With that, I will pass the presenter ball over to our first presenter, Dr. Caitlin S. L. Perello. Welcome. All right. Um, thank you for that introduction, Elizabeth. So, yeah, my name is Caitlin Perello, and I am an associate scientist at Biomodels LLC in Watertown, Massachusetts. And I just wanted to start by giving a little bit of background about Biomodels for those of you who are not familiar with our company. Biomodels is a preclinical contract research organization, and as I said, we're located in Watertown, Massachusetts, and we were founded in 1997 out of the Brigham and Women's Hospital. Biomodel focuses on highly translational models of human diseases and conditions for a wide variety of clients. And we have therapeutic expertise in inflammation autoimmunity, oncology, pulmonary disease and fibrosis, as well as cancer supportive care, among others. And moreover, Biomodels has facilitated 44 compounds into patients from multiple indications. Our objectives for today are to first introduce the advantages to utilizing germ-free or notobiotic mice when probing disease models with microbiome components, describe the terminology used when discussing notobiotic studies, and to discuss the roles of the microbiome in marrying models of human disease. And just a brief overview of my talk today, we're going to start with an introduction, then we'll move on to utilizing germ-free and notobiotic mice. Then we'll move on to examples of the role of the microbiome in murine disease models. And today we're going to discuss graft versus host disease, or GDHD, oncology, and inflammatory bowel disease, or IBD. And then we'll finish up with summary and conclusion. So we've all heard a lot about the gut microbiome and how it can affect everything from autoimmune disease and food sensitivities to neurological diseases such as mood disorders and autism. Bacteria colonize almost every environmentally exposed surface of the human body. Though the greatest quantity and diversity is found in the lower GI tract, biomes exist for the skin and hair, as well as all mucosal surfaces like the mouth, nostrils, and vagina. So what is the gut microbiome? It is the phrase used to describe the trillions of bacteria that live in the gut of an adult human. And these trillions of bacteria represent thousands of species-level phylogenetic types. In fact, there are more microbes associated with antibiotic resistance in the intestines of a normal person and can be found on the surfaces and materials of the Boston subway system. So the bacteria that are within the gut fall into three different categories. Commensals and mutualists are bacteria that are permanent residents of the gut but provide no benefit or detriment to the host, at least not to our knowledge. The second group are known as symbionts. And these symbiotic bacteria live in homeostasis within the intestinal immune system. These are considered to be health-promoting bacteria, and they can have effects on nutrition and metabolism, drug metabolism, defense against opportunistic pathogens, development of intestinal architecture, and they can also play a role in the prevention of inflammatory diseases. The third class of bacteria that can reside within the human gut are called pathobionts. These are permanent residents of the microbiota that have the potential to induce pathology. In some people, microbial imbalances in the gut can occur, and this is known as dysbiosis. And dysbiosis is associated with multiple disease states, including inflammatory disorders like IBD, autoimmune disorders like multiple sclerosis, allergic diseases like asthma, and metabolic disorders like obesity. Genetics does play in the role of the, in the development of dysbiosis to some extent as mutations in genes like NOD2 and the IL-23 receptor are associated with dysbiosis. However, much of dysbiosis is likely caused by circumstances and events like route of birth, lifestyle, and medical decisions, such as antibiotic use, or on radiation and ionic suppression. So with that, I'm going to move on to the focus of the talk, utilizing germ-free and notobiotic mice. 
So notobiotic animals were first developed by James Rainier in, in 1939 at Le Bund, or the Laboratories of Bacteriology at University of Notre Dame. And the Rainier lab successfully derived and grew germ-free rats. These germ-free rats were derived by C-section and were hand-raised in isolators by round-the-clock feeding using hand-drawn glass pipettes as feeding tubes. Today, mice are the primary animals used for germ-free work, and they're typically bred within the germ-free environment. Rederivation is only necessary when new strains are to be introduced, and most labs typically use embryo transfer to produce these new germ-free strains. So the way that we describe the health status of animals is with biological barriers. And biological barriers are designed to keep land animals free from contact with microbes. Each level of barrier is defined by the microbes that are excluded and by the methods needed to create and preserve that particular barrier. And I wanted to go over this terminology because I think that there is often some um, that people tend to use the words notobiotic and germ-free interchangeably, and they're not really the same thing. So the first barrier is conventional, which is no barrier. There's no restriction of microbes, and of course, the microflora is not defined. The second level is SPF, or specific pathogen free. These mice live in HEPA filter cages, and there are efforts made to restrict the microbes that these mice come in contact with. And the general idea is to avoid the mice coming into contact with any murine pathogens. However, again, the microbes that are living within these mice are not defined. The next level is notobiotic. And as I said, notobiotic and germ-free tend to be used interchangeably. However, notobiotic mice are not germ-free. They are germ-free mice that were colonized with defined microbes, and they live within the germ-free isolators. What this does is that it ensures that only the bacteria that were put in by you are staying within those animals. So thus, they do have a defined microbiota. The next level would be germ-free raxenic. These are the true germ-free mice. They live in the germ-free isolators and they have a defined microbiota in that they do uh, not have any microbiota. And finally, there are conventionalized mice. These are germ-free mice that we removed from the isolator and there's no restricted microbes or defined microflora. Here at Biomodels, we currently have 14 isolators and these isolators can hold 20 to 25 mice per isolator. And I really want to reiterate that when using germ-free isolators, you can have complete confidence that the only bacteria colonizing these mice are the bacteria that you put in. This is really powerful. Whether you're analyzing the therapeutic potential of a particular bacterial composition or whether you're trying to determine a drug's effect on overall microbiome composition, because any outside influence of the environment on the microbiome is completely controlled. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn the mic over to Jennifer Salem, who's going to talk about um, taconics germ-free mice and how taconics germ-free facilities work with biomodels. Thank you, Caitlin. So more and more health and disease states are being linked to the microbiome. The interest in the microbiome is growing in a variety of research areas, including oncology, immunology, neurology, and metabolic disease. Notobiotic and germ-free mice provide researchers with the tools required to obtain insights into human diseases. The gut microbiota describes the collection of microbes living in the intestine. It's challenging to identify a particular species due to the tens of trillions of microorganisms that populate the gut, similar to playing a game of Where's Waldo? It's reported that while 30% of our gut microbiota is common to most people, the remaining 70% are specific to each one of us. It is unique to each individual, causing complexities in finding overlaps. More than 1,000 different known bacterial species can be found in the human gut microbiota, but only 150 to 170 in any given subject. In order to understand disease and the health consequences of the microbiome, scientists look for common subsets between individuals with particular diseases. Scientific advances have allowed researchers to zoom in on bacteria living in the GI tract and define commonalities between subjects and use those findings to interpret their consequences on human health. This is the type of research that's taking place at Biomodels. The mouse 
provides an excellent model system as they're easy to manipulate in their health, genetics, and their microbiome. The volume of published studies employing notobiotic or germ-free mice increased dramatically over the past 15 years, in part due to growing interest in microbiome research. There's a significant opportunity to develop therapeutics that change or leverage the microbiome, especially with all the talk of per personalized medicine. Germ-free animal models play a crucial role in understanding the interaction between microbiome, disease prevention, and treatment. The first attempts to grow germ-free animals were undertaken in 1895 with guinea pigs at the Hygiene Institute of Berlin. Experiments were continued with the chicks for more than a decade, but with no success. The first successful germ-free vertebrate experiment, which was also with chicks, was in 1912. Shortly thereafter, some germ-free goats were kept alive for about two months. Subsequent advances in methodology during the 20s and 30s paved the way for a new germ-free vision. This was realized at the Lobund Institute. This germ-free lab promised new understanding of aging, as well as providing the vehicle by which new treatments would be discovered. Scientists were curious whether germ-free organisms would live longer and planned to study cancer, heart disease, tooth decay, and more. That first germ-free lab was beyond the capabilities of most research institutions to replicate. In the early 1960s, the Connick staff traveled to Labund to learn how to produce germ-free mice and began offering Swiss Webster outbred mice. In the 1980s, the Connick added germ-free Sprague Dolly rats at the germ-free health standard. In 2010, there was a huge increase in demand for germ-free mice overall and for more models at that restrictive health standard. It was also when we introduced the black six mouse at the germ-free health standard. In 2015, we hosted our first microbiome symposium in Cambridge, Mass. This was an opportunity for researchers to get together and share information. In 2016, we've already held one symposium in New York, and we have two more planned before the end of the year. And in 2017, Taconic is planning new models at the germ-free health standard. In the early years of germ-free animal model research, the focus was nutrition, infectious disease, and dental disease. These were the most common applications. Starting in the 80s, immunology researchers started studying differences in immune response of germ-free mice, as well as allergy and antibody development. And they also began adapting animals with human flora. These lines of investigation led researchers to examine the roles of microbiota in development, immune response, and protection from diseases ranging from cancer to diabetes to rheumatoid arthritis. Since 2000, the Google Scholar references for germ-free mice have been growing exponentially. There's been increasing demand for germ-free models due to improvements in technology and growing interest in the microbiome. Animals in the Taconic Notobiotic Center are maintained in flexible film isolators. It's generally accepted that germ-free mice can be maintained for short durations in individually ventilated cages. However, isolators should be used for maintaining the germ-free health standard for longer studies and for breeding projects. It's important to do weekly microbial testing to ensure the animals maintain their notobiotic status. The germ-free models allow investigators to manipulate the host immunity to promote or prevent disease traits. It's also important to note that antibiotic-treated mice, which are sometimes used, will work effectively in studies that examine disruptions in the microbiome or that involve particular groups of bacteria. However, for other studies, particularly fecal microbiota transplants, germ-free mice are preferred. Working with germ-free models requires additional resources and study planning. Setting up a new germ-free facility can be very expensive, labor-intensive, and time-consuming. This is why many short-term studies utilize individually ventilated cages. As a best practice, you should try a pilot study to assess your germ-free technique prior to starting a large cohort. Make sure technicians are comfortable entering and exiting supplies through the port and check for leaks and contaminations prior to placing mice in the isolator. 
Taconic has experienced significant growth in our demand for germ-free and notobiotic models. These models allow the investigators to start with a blank slate. Our commercially available models right now are the Swiss Webster and the Black Six Mouse, with more coming next year. In the September 5th issue of Bloomberg Business Week, Peter Smith wrote about his discussions with a variety of scientists working in the microbiome and germ-free space. Their discussions included Ben Kufo from Biomodels. Peter also visited Deconic in May for a tour of our notobiotic center. His article highlights the importance of germ-free mice in microbiome research. It also discusses that a lot of the work takes place in academic institutions. However, it's important to note that biomodels can perform a vast array of these notobiotic studies. Taconic provides a variety of services related to germ-free and microbiome studies. We have models at various health standards. We also have the off-the-shelf germ-free models and some defined flora models. We do custom flora associations and biosampling. We're basically using the germ-free mouse as a substrate to determine the effect of FMT composition. We also offer germ-free workshops and educational materials, symposia. And it's also important to note here, for more complex studies, Biomodels is capable of performing these types of studies. Taconic quickly recognized the value of germ-free mice for research and developed more economical germ-free animal breeding facilities. Following its first germ-free animal model projects in 1961 featuring the Swiss Webster mouse, we brought germ-free production techniques into routine use. More than 50 years later, Taconic is still the only proven commercial source for germ-free mice. This is critical as germ-free mice are a key to elucidating the role of the microbiome in disease. Custom flora associations allow scientists to better understand the role of the microbiome in disease development, leading to novel therapeutic discoveries. Those first researchers over 60 years ago could not have imagined today's applications for germ-free mice and animal models. Perhaps 60 years from now, we will be equally amazed. The Translational Microbiome Research Forum provides resources, publications, and news related to the microbiome. You can sign up online for updates. It allows an exchange of information between different scientists. And also, Taconic has planned two more micro, microbiome symposia for our series this year on November 3rd in Washington, D.C. and November 17th in Chicago. I will wrap up by saying that Caitlin from Biomodels will be presenting in Chicago, and I will pass it back over to her. All right. Thank you, Jennifer. So our germ-free isolators at Biomodels are maintained under strict asepsis. Nothing enters the isolators without being pre-sterilized, whether that is by steam sterilization with an autoclave or cold sterilization with a chlorine dioxide-based sterilant like Clydox, or most often, both. So what that means is that anything, everything that is necessary for the animals to live is entered into the isolator before the animals get there and is sterilized, and that includes things like food, water, and bedding. The animals themselves are also entered aseptically. And the way that we do that is by using the uh, Takana germ-free shipper. And um, I'm highlighting an image here that shows the animals being entered into the isolator with the germ-free shipper. And the, the animals, when entered this way, are nev they never come into contact with the environment, so their germ-free status is not compromised. Also, everything that is necessary for the study is entered aseptically, including test article, and all animal manipulation that is occurring throughout the study occurs within the isolator. So survival monitoring, weighing the animals, and any sample collections and test article administration. So what that means is that quality control is very crucial. All of our autoclave loads are validated by spore tests, and we do frequent swabbing and culturing to ensure that the isolators are still sterile. And uh, this figure shows just an example experiment that when conventional animals are housed in the germ-free isolators, they do maintain um, countable fecal colonies throughout a two-week period. However, germ-free animals show no growth on plates over the two-week period. 
Um, so just to summarize this section, I've shown you that germ-free isolators allow for the study of defined specific microbiome composition. Applications where we plan to use these isolators include examples of DNA models of disease like GVHD oncology and IVD. And the isolators allow us to look at to address questions such as how DNA models of disease are affected by dysbiosis or by specific microbiome composition. To do this, we can use FMTs or fecal microbial transplants that are sourced from healthy control patients or from the disease population. And we can also look at symbionts versus pathobionts versus pathogens. Additionally, we can look at whether restoration of eubiosis can be therapeutic by using bugs and drugs. The germ-free isolators are really such a powerful way to do these experiments. If, for example, a disease phenotype is observed from various microbiome compositions, we know that the phenotype is truly due to your composition because the environmental effects on the microbiome are controlled. So now I'm going to move on to the next part of the talk, examples of the role of the microbiome in mirroring disease models, and we're going to go over GVHD, oncology, and IBD. So patients that are undergoing allogeneic hematopoietic stem cell transplants, or allogeneic HSCT, are at risk for developing graft versus host disease, or GVHD. There's an approximately 80% incidence of GVHD within 12 to 14 post-transplant, and this is considered acute GVHD. However, 30 to 70% of patients will ultimately develop chronic GVHD. And GVHD is a leading cause of death in allogeneic HSCT survivors. GVHD involves multiple organs, including the skin, mucosa, GI tract, liver, and lungs. And it's dependent on antigen-specific T cells that originate within the graft. Furthermore, hosts that are receiving allogeneic HSCTs are generally immunocompromised, whether by steroids, methotrexate, or mTOR inhibitors. This immunocompromised status is required for engraftment. However, it can also impact the microbiome. There is evidence from the clinic that the microbiome plays a role in GDHD. It's been demonstrated that patients with a less diverse intestinal microbiome have decreased overall survival post-transplant as well as an increased risk for the development of transplant-related death. Patients that have a more diverse microbiome have a lower uh, risk of death from transplant. And there are several examples of a role for the microbiome in GVHD from the literature. So our GVHD model involves a transplant of bone marrow that is supplemented with lymphocytes into an MHC mismatched host. The disease induction is dependent on the presence of donors CD4 and CD8 T cells, as well as antigen-presenting cells, or APCs. And the disease occurs in two stages, with two phases. From days 0 to 14, most of the disease that's seen is due to the irradiation. Grassman occurs on day 1. However, any phenotype that is observed from day 14 to the conclusion is considered to be due to GDHD. To begin to discern any potential role to the microbiome in our marine model of GVHD, we started with addressing the question of whether antibiotic modulation of the intestinal microbiome can affect marine GVHD. To achieve this, the mice were on antibiotic regimens prior to total body irradiation and engraftment. Antibiotic dosing was stopped before the GVHD phase of the study. So when looking at weight loss, there were no significant differences observed between animals that were on antibiotic and animals that were not. And similarly, there were no significant differences observed on, in terms of GVHD score when looking at animals on antibiotics or those that were not. However, when we looked at survival, there were differential effects. When we looked at the early stages of disease, there was a near significant difference in survival between animals that received antibiotics and animals that did not, with the animals receiving antibiotics surviving. However, if you look at survival only from day 12 on, so that's during the phase of the disease when it's due to GVHD, there were no differences in survival. So just to summarize, I showed you that antibiotic retreatment has limited effects on GVHD progression. No effects on weight change or GVHD scores were observed. However, there was a trend towards differential survival at early time points. There were a number of unanswered questions with this um, experiment, and many of these unanswered questions can be addressed using germ-free isolators. We don't know exactly what was depleted and how extensively it was depleted, nor do we know the lasting effects on the intestinal microbiome of that antibiotic modulation. Essentially, doing the experiment in this way just left too many unknowns. And what we'd like to do is to use germ-free or notobiotic mice 
in GBHD experiments. The reason why we think that doing these experiments in germ-free isolators is really best is because, for example, if we truly want to know if the microbiome is required for the progression of GBHD, the best way to address that question is to look at GBHD in germ-free mice. And if we want to know the effects of various microbiome compositions on GVHD progression, the best way to address this is to recolonize germ-free mice with the microbiome composition in question, and then to induce GVHD. So now going to move on to cancer in the microbiome. It's well known that chronic infections can contribute to carcinogenesis, and about 18% of the global cancer burden is directly due to infectious agents. For example, it's known that H. pylori can cause gastritis, which ultimately leads to gastric ulcer, atrophy, and gastric cancer. Moreover, Salmonella and Terica subspecies are associated with gallbladder cancer. On the bottom here, I'm showing a figure um, from a recent review by Schwab and Jobin. While I don't expect anyone watching to be able to read this table, I included it to demonstrate the large number of cancers in which a role for the microbiome has been demonstrated. And here we're looking at a pretty complicated slide from that same review, but don't worry, I'm uh, going to break it down. So the first way that uh, the microbiome can have an effect on carcinogenesis is through dysbiosis. Dysbiosis favors increased bacterial translocation, which leads to increased inflammation mediated by microor microorganism associated molecular patterns, or MAMPs, which activates malic receptors and not like receptors. TLR activation promotes carcinogenesis in several organs, and it's been demonstrated that TLR4 deficient mice demonstrate less tumor development than wild type mice do. Nod like receptors, such as NOD2, also can contribute to carcinogenesis. Nod2 deficient mice have an increased risk of developing colorectal cancers, as do individuals with Nod2 polymorphism. Another way that microorganisms can affect tumor genesis is through the production of toxins. Examples include cytolethal descending toxin made by several gram negative bacteria, such as Shigella dysenteriae in E. coli, and colibactin, which is made by E. coli. These toxins can induce DNA damage responses and can trigger double strand DNA damage, including activation of the ATM CHIC2 signaling pathway. And finally, the third way that the microbiome can affect carcinogenesis is through the metabolic activities of the microbiome. These include regulating obesity and obesity induced inflammation, metabolic activation and inactivation of carcinogens, metabolism of hormones, and the generation of tumor promoting secondary bile acids. The microbiome can also have effects on whether a patient responds to cancer treatment. There have been several um, publications in this area recently, one of which investigated the uh, role of the microbiome and more traditional medications such as cyclophosphamide. Um, and two of them were looking at the more recent cancer immunotherapies like anti ct 4 therapy and anti pd one therapy. The most well-known uh, pa uh, paper that went over these was this paper on the bottom by Sivan et al. And this paper demonstrated that taconic mice develop larger tumors more quickly than Jackson mice do. We repeated that experiment, and we found the exact opposite. In our hands, mice sourced from Jackson labs develop larger tumors more quickly than mice sourced from taconic biosciences. Moreover, the paper demonstrated a therapeutic effect of bifidobacteria, whether alone or in combination with anti pdl one therapy. We saw no effect of bifido alone, nor did it increase the efficacy of anti pdl one therapy. So to summarize, I showed that an understanding of the microbiome or oncobiome has translational potential to benefit, benefit patients, whether this is by looking at how the microbiome can affect carcinogenesis itself, or whether by looking at how the microbiome affects patient responses to therapy. However, there are several unanswered questions with the data that I just showed you. We do not know if the mice that we use from Taconic and Jackson were from the same barrier as the mice that were used um, in the paper. So we don't know if our mice had the same microbiome as those used within the paper. Moreover, we also don't know the success of our bifido infection. Again, the best way to do these experiments is using germ-free or notobiotic mice within germ-free isolators. To determine if the microbiome is necessary for either disease progression or response to therapy, we would like to induce disease in germ-free mice. And to determine if particular components of the microbiome can affect responses to therapy, we'd like to recolonize germ-free mice with the microbiome composition in question and then induce disease and treat.
which brings me to IBD. IBD, or inflammatory bowel disease, is a spectrum of chronic gastrointestinal disorders, including ulcerative colitis, or UC, and Crohn's disease. And these diseases are characterized by alternating periods of relapses and remission. They're clinically characterized by diarrhea, abdominal pain, and bleeding, and are typically diagnosed by endoscopy. So the diseases are typically of unknown etiology. It's known that the environment and genetics both play a role. And it's also known that the microbiota can play a role. The role for the intestinal microbiome in IBD has been demonstrated in multiple mouse models of IBD. It's been shown that several species can exacerbate IBD, including Prevotelliaceae species, which can exacerbate chemically induced colitis. And Helicobacter species can drive colitis in IL-10 knockout mice. The microbiome can also protect in mouse models of IBD. Clostridium species have been shown to confer resistance to, to colitis, and polysaccharide A produced by Bacteroides gillis can confer protection from the Helicobacter-induced colitis in IL-10 mice. There's also data from the clinic looking at the role of the microbiome in IBD. Here you can see that there are several species that are increased in Crohn's disease patients versus healthy controls, and there are several species that are decreased in Crohn's disease patients versus healthy controls. And these effects are exacerbated when the Crohn's disease patients were treated with antibiotics. I also wanted to highlight that two of the species that are shown to be decreased in Crohn's disease patients include the species that on the previous slide were shown to have um, protective effects in mouse models of IBD. So to begin to look at the role for the microbiome in IBD, we started by looking at vendor differences and how mice respond to DFS-induced colitis. When we were comparing black six mice that were sourced from either Charles liver or from taconic biosciences. So the kinetics and weight loss were similar when comparing the two strains. The magnitude differed, with Charles River mice treated with 3% DSS, demonstrating increased weight loss as compared to that of the taconic animals. When observing inflammation by endoscopy, both the kinetics and magnitude differed. Animal sourced from Charles River treated with 3% DSS demonstrated a maximum endoscopy score of about 3 on day 10, whereas the maximum score observed in taconic mice was around a 2 and was observed on day 14. So it looks like there's some sort of a protective effect going on with the conic bias, and we hypothesize that the microbiome is mediating this protective effect. To address this hypothesis, we performed a similar CFS experiment in germ-free mice from taconic. In this case, we were using 2.5% CFS. So while the conventional taconic mice did not get as sick as the Charles River mice, which I just showed you, the germ-free taconic mice got much sicker than the conventional taconic mice. So these animals were only on 2.5% DSS. We saw quite a bit of mortality as well as weight loss and a significantly elevated endoscopy score. So again, to summarize, a role for the microbiome in IVD is supported by mirroring models of IVD. Animal source from different vendors, such as Charles River versus Taconic, responded differently to DSS-induced colitis. And we saw this by the fact that they had differential weight loss as well as adopted scores. However, germ-free animals sourced from Taconic demonstrated increased sensitivity to DSS-induced colitis. They had decreased survival, increased weight loss, as well as increased endoscopy score. We're comparing the conventional mice with Taconic and Charles River. We don't know yet if the differences in DFS sensitivity were due to microbiota or were simply just due to genetic drift and differences in the genetics of the two models. And we'd like to continue looking at these um, questions using germ-free and notobiotic mice as defined for the virus. So finally, um, to summarize and conclude, I showed that the microbiome plays a significant role in human health and disease and that germ-free isolators allow for the study of defined specific microbiome compositions in notobiotic mice. I also showed you examples of murine models in which um, the microbiome can play a role, including grass versus host disease, oncology, and inflammatory bowel disease. And with that, I'd just like to take the time to acknowledge um, all of the coworkers and colleagues, all of whom were integral to all of the data that I just showed. And I'd like to leave you with mine and Jennifer's contact information. And um, you can email either of us any questions that you had on this presentation. And thank you so much for taking the time to listen to us today. Thank you very much, Caitlin. And Jennifer, thank you as well. Most of all, I'd like to thank 
Biomodels for sponsoring today's web symposium. And most especially, I'd like to thank those of you who came and spent some time with us. I hope you are able to find answers for your research problems. Thank you so much and have a great day.